Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's educational webinar on multidisciplinary management of spine pain. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Siddharth Shagari, orthoneuro neurosurgeon. Dr. Shagari is a board eligible fellowship trained neurosurgeon specializing in minimally invasive spine surgery and complex spinal deformity conditions. Dr. Shagari's scope of service includes minimally invasive spine surgery for degenerative conditions, complex spine surgery for scoliosis for adolescents and adults, spinal fusions, spine trauma surgery, spine tumor surgery, spinal cord stimulation, pain pump placement, kyphoplasty, sacroiliac joint surgery, and general and traumatic cranial neurosurgery. Dr. Gary will answer questions following his presentation. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Gary. All right, hello everybody. Nice to be here with you guys today. Um, I'm going to press share over here so you guys can share my screen. Is that right, Heather? Yes. Okay. All right, share. All right, can everybody see? Yes. All right, great. Okay. Play from start. There Play from start. All right. Perfect. So um, I'm going to have a, can you guys hear, can you guys see me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I can't see myself or Heather right now. So I, I'm just, uh, you know, making sure that everybody can see me and uh, we can progress. Okay. So um, we're going to progress to the common causes of low back pain. Um, so before we go into the nitty gritty of, of, of low back pain, why it occurs and what treatments we have available um, as spine surgeons, um, I just wanted to kind of uh, go back to what matters the most. And, you know, this is a quote by um, uh, the Apple founder. Um, what matters the most is the user experience. You know, Steve Jobs always used to say that the user experience matters the most. And for that reason, um, we decided to do something similar in my practice at OrthoNeuro, that the patient experience matters the most. So um, the patient experience is what we start with, not the other way around. And we work backwards to make the entire practice centered around the patient experience. Um, uh, and of course, the referral physician experience, your primary care physicians um, also need to have um, an experience that is concordant to them wanting to work with us. Okay. So let's start with uh, some basic spinal anatomy. The human spine consists of three primary sections, the, the cervical, which is the neck, the, thir the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, which is the mid back, and the lumbar spine, which is the low back. And you know problems occur in all different levels of the spine, but these three are the ones that we identify with um, when we say something is a neck pain, neck pain issue, a mid back pain issue, or a low back pain issue. Um, each one of this, each one of these segments consists of two bones and one disc. Um, the vertebral bodies over here are the actual bones and the load-bearing bones of the spine. Uh, the intervertebral disc is like the, um, the jelly and the donut kind of analogy to where there's a soft segment and a hard shell kind of segment. And um, that's the front of the spine. In the middle and the back of the spine, there are the pedicles, which are bony channels that, um, that we use to identify uh, a lumbar or thoracic or cervical segments. And the joints in the back of the spine are called facet joints, okay? So what are the causes of, of, of back pain? Loss of strength, loss of flexibility, poor body mechanics like poor posture or improper lifting when we lift you know, heavy objects or things like that. Um, stressful living and working conditions obviously can cause issues with your back, with your neck, with your lower back, and of course, excessive weight. Anytime, you know, your back has to work a harder than it needs to, um, it's going to have to break down faster. And as a result, you start having back pain. Um, sometimes when people have spinal fusions or previous spine surgery, um, we, we can have degeneration of segments that are normal above or below the spine fusion levels. And this is something we commonly see in especially um, legacy type spine surgeries, okay? Um, what are the causes of pain? Degeneration. Degeneration is a natural process. Every single person you see has some level of degenerative spine disease. Degenerative spine disease is, pre is pretty normal. That does not mean that everyone with degenerative spine disease needs surgery. Um, people call it the gray hairs of the spine. Um, but when it becomes symptomatic, when it becomes excessively painful is when it, can, when it can become a problem. Deformity is an abnormal curvature of the spine 
such as a scoliosis curvature or um, too much of a curve falling forward or falling backward that can cause pain. Trauma, an accident or acute injury um, or unplanned type injuries of the spine can cause pain as well. Muscle strain, which are insertions of muscle and tendon into parts of the spine that can be strained or sometimes torn or a ligament or tendon sprain. Okay. Um, okay. Fractures over here. This is the third kind of example. I just had some additional um, uh, pictures of this. This is called a compression fracture, which is a fracture um, caused by forces going up and down on the spine. And this is uh, a muscle strain type pain over here, which is the trapezius muscle and the latissimus muscle. All right. What kinds of pain are common with respect to spine pain? There's something called radicular pain. Radicular pain means pain associated with one root. A radical is a uh, uh, the, the Latin word for root. And so it is usually arm, hand, leg, or foot pain, often described as burning or tingling following the same pattern of the nerves and can be caused by pinching of the nerves as they exit the spine, sometimes caused by a bulging discs or bone spurs in the spine, both in the neck and in the low back. And so this is where a herniated disc over here can put pressure on one nerve coming out of the spine, as you can see. Um, there's another type of pain called claudication. Claudication means pinching of the entire kind of canal of the spine, usually in the low back, okay? Um, it can be caused uh, uh, by, it, it can be relieved by flexion of the spine forward. So people have this um, stenosis or radic or a claudication pain. Um, when they lean forward, they can feel better because it increases the diameter of the spine. This is caused by pinching of the nerves inside the spinal canal by the bulging disc or the bone spurs. So there's a radicular type of pain, a claudication type of pain. And right over here, as you can see, as this is the normal kind of anatomy over here. And as the arthritis kind of uh, um, uh, uh, crowds the canal over here, it's going to cause the claudication type of pain. There's a pain called sacroiliac pain, which is pain on the one or both sides of the low lumbar spine caused by inflammation or wear and tear of the sacroiliac joint, commonly called the SI joint. Um, um, usually you can locate the pain with one finger and that's called a Fortin's test. And it can feel like it has a butterfly type pain distribution in the low lumbar spine. Uh, this is the adjacent level disease. Occurs as the levels above and below previous areas of surgery degenerate over time. As you can see, this patient over here has a spinal fusion. And as time goes on, uh, the level above and the level below is starting to wear out faster and faster because this acts like one large block of, of non-mobile bone, you know? So this can be result in increasing back pain, increasing leg pain, and increasing stress on levels next to these fused segments. Um, let's talk about degenerative disc disease. Uh, it's a naturally occurring process, as we talked about, it may become symptomatic in certain individuals. This is a herniated disc right over here. Um, the jelly has popped out of the donut, so to speak, and it's causing pressure inside the nerve hole over here. This is a degenerated disc. And this is a disc with some bone spurs called osteophytes, okay? Then there is also a kind of syndrome called spondylolisthesis. As you can see over here, one vertebra slips on top of the other, causing misalignment of the area where the nerves live, which is inside the canal right over here. Um, this is uh, usually caused by thickened ligament or bone putting pressure on the nerves as the bone starts to slip forward and forward. So what kind of tests do we do to diagnose these types of problems? One of the tests is called an X-ray um, where you know, we can see um, the calcium parts of the body um, in, in contrast to the soft tissue parts of the body. Um, everybody has, an, has had an X-ray at some point in their life. This is an X-ray of the spine and the low back. This is an X-ray of a patient's neck, okay? CT scans are basically uh, fancier X-rays that have been shot in multiple directions and, and, and collimated together. And uh, they basically show us a good three-dimensional picture of bone compared with soft tissue. Um, it is most, uh, most often better to see bone in these types of, of scans. 
Another scan is called an MRI scan. And this, uh, this appear, this is uh, at this point in our history, the more refined type of exam because it very clearly shows us soft tissue such as the spinal cord, such as ligaments and tendons and discs uh, compared with bone, okay? So what kind of treatments are there for things like low back pain or neck pain? Um, we start from one continuum and go to the other continuum. Um, the first continuum is conservative. And uh, as we go more and more aggressive, we start to go towards things like surgery. And obviously, when something is conservative, the risk is low. When something is a little more aggressive, the risk is higher. Okay. Um, typically, we start with, with uh, behavior modification, physical therapy, chiropractic care has good results in select patients, bracing pain medications, uh, pain injections, which is a little more aggressive than pain medications, and then surgery from uh, smaller surgeries to bigger surgeries might be something that is necessary, okay? Non-surgical treatments. Um, so physical therapy, pain medications, anti-inflammatories, because you know joint pain responds well to anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, high-dose Motrin, um, Voltaren, uh, sometimes lidocaine patches and those types of things. Um, chiropractic care sets to uh, uh, um, restore alignment to the spine. Bracing does something similar with a little more um, aggressive kind of maneuvers and behavior modification. Patients need to be trained to um, uh, exercise proper, proper body mechanics and physical therapy. And those kinds of behavior modifications can help with low back pain, spine pain, neck pain. Non-surgical treatments. Um, look, more than 70% of all people in developing countries will develop back pain at some point in time. Not all of them need surgery. And conservative treatment uh, uh, and targeted therapies can, can um, uh, be directed towards patients that don't need surgery. Um, the majority of cases of back pain improve within six months with conservative treatment and non-surgical treatment. What kind of conservative treatments are there? Ice and heat, NSAID medications like muscle relaxants. I'm sorry, NSAID medications like ibuprofen and anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxants, nerve-specific medications like uh, gabapentin or Neurontin or Celexa can be options. Um, physical therapy, which uh, strengthens the core of the spine, the muscles that surround the spine, uh, increased range of motion, increased flexibility. Um, then we get to a, a few more aggressive kind of uh, um, non-surgical things like TENS units, ultrasounds, massage, dry needling, and body mechanic uh, uh, training. Um, after that, we go into injections. Injections sound scarier than they are. Injections directed towards cause of chronic back pain can help. Um, they are usually done with x-ray that significantly increases the safety of injections. They can induce, um, and uh, pain management physicians uh, use very powerful anti-inflammatory corticosteroids and steroid medications like Canalog. They usually don't involve sedation. It's usually a... Um, uh, a local anesthesia. Um, it's a quite a low risk, very little discomfort, and little to recovery time. Okay. What kind of injections are there? Um, it depends upon the, the type of pain that the pain management physician or the surgeon is trying to treat. Um, the most common injection is the epidural steroid injections. It targets degenerative disc disease, radiculopathy, and spinal stenosis. Um, the needle goes into the epidural space. So the epidural space is right over here in this white line right over here where the needle is pointing into. Uh, the steroids are injected into the irritated nerves or onto the irritated nerves, sorry, and can be repeated four times in 12 months to reduce the possibility of uh, interactions with um, patients' hormone systems. There are things called facet injections. Facet injections are injections given into these joints over here in the back of the spine um, involving x-rays steroids and numbing medications and can be used for this. And they are uh, used for both diagnosis and treatment of facet mediated pain. Back pain responds the best to these types of treatments, um, uh, facet blocks, okay? And some people call them medial branch blocks, MBBs. And if that works, the next step would be a radio frequency ablation, which is in some pain management practices called burning of the nerves. Um, that can be option as well. All right, RFA, here we go. Burn the lining 
or ablates the lining of the nerves carrying the pain from the arthritis into the joints. Um, these aren't burning the big nerves that come out of the spine, just little wispy nerves that go into the joints. Um, they can make a big difference for patients with back pain that does not travel into the thighs or legs. Um, pain relief lasts six to 12 months. The, the nerve lining unfortunately does grow back. It can be repeated every six months, okay? Let's talk about another generator of pain. The sacroiliac joint injection um, is where the hip bone, which is this thing right over here, or which is this thing right over here. And I'm gonna play it a little video for you guys. So the hip bone, which is this thing, meets the tailbone, which is this thing. Um, it radiates into the groin on the same side and the thigh on the same side. Uh, worse with transitional movements, when you, when you move from one sitting, sitting to standing, that kind of thing. The risk factors for these include weak core muscles, obesity, pregnancy, and previous lumbar and spinal fusions. So let's talk about the more aggressive types of treatment, surgical treatment. Surgery treatments has um, a four main goals, um, provide pain relief, preserve function, restore the activity, and minimal disruption of anatomy. And that's the, the goal of surgery or as much of a goal as possible of surgery. What are the types of spine surgery that are available? And myself as a surgeon, I do some injections and I do most spine surgeries over here. The first pain, I'm sorry, the first uh, surgery is called leg pain surgery. Um, these are small incisions. They are typically outpatient and they are meant for leg pain and leg pain only. Um, the second kind of type of spine surgery is called back pain surgery. And this typically involves fixation with screws to stop painful motion. Um, the third kind of spine surgery is called spinal deformity surgery, which is meant for scoliosis of either adolescents or adults. And the fourth kind of surgery is called functional surgery. Functional surgery is a specific kind of surgery designed to interrupt pain signals from the trunk, from the legs to the brain, and to increase quality of life in that way. Okay. We'll talk about these each one. Okay. So this is a leg pain surgery before and after. This is called the laminectomy, which is why the lamina, which is this back part of the spine is removed over here to reduce pressure on the nerves. This is a spinal fusion surgery in the neck. And this is a spinal fusion surgery in the low back. This is a spinal deformity surgery that involves multiple levels of spinal surgery um, to reduce painful curving of the spine or painful tipping forward of the spine. Let's talk about the first kind of surgery, leg pain surgery. Leg pain surgery is typically a minimally invasive technique where a series of dilators are used to access the spine through a small incision. Typically it's between 18 and 20 millimeters, uh, which is about one inch. Um, it reduces, the, uh, uh, it reduces um, um, uh, the injury to the muscles. We spread the muscles rather than cut the muscles open. Um, this is called either a microdiscectomy, a laminectomy, or a furminotomy. It's usually outpatient surgery, which means you go home the same day. And uh, uh, typically it's a one hour recovery and uh, discharge after that. This is one of the tubes that we use. There are several tubes that are, in, that, that, that are able to be used with this, typically this, this kind of surgery. These are the dilators that go onto the spine. They dock onto the spine. And then this tube goes right on top of it. And the whole surgery is done under a microscope and an X-ray machine. Um, let's talk about the second form of surgery, which is back pain surgery. Um, the modern lumbar fusion has come a long way since uh, the um, uh, a traditional uh, wide open incision type of lumbar fusion. There are three kinds of lumbar fusion that are done pretty commonly in this day and age. One is called the T-lift, which is a surgery done with two little incisions. And we'll talk about that in detail in a minute. Um, there's one called an A-lift, which is a, a spinal fusion done from the front, uh, which is called an anterior uh, a lumbar fusion. And a D-lift, which is a surgery done from the side of the spine, um, which is called the direct lateral, which means directly from the side, intrabody fusion, okay? And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So if the if instability of the spine is a concern, um, the surgeon has to make the spine stable, and that is done with a fusion procedure. 
an interbody device, which is a little cage, which is the size of my knuckle to the fingertip, um, is inserted through a tube directly in between the two segments of the spine, the two vertebral bodies. Um, the inner body device is then used to promote fusion of the two segments, the two segments of the spine, the bone above and the bone below. All right, this is called a T-lift. And a T-lift means um, that this is a minimally invasive surgery performed exclusively, uh, exclusively under X-ray and a microscope um, in the same kind of tube that we talked about for the smaller surgery. The screws are placed over wires and the intrabody device is placed through a tube system. And this is the top of a tube system right over here. All right. And this is what it looks like in an animation. The screws are placed from the sides with two front, through two little incisions. And the intrabody device, which is that um, the cage system, is placed through a tube. Okay. This is these are the incisions for this particular kind of surgery. Two little incisions, about one inch on each side of the spine. For a one-level surgery, which means an L4-5, one-level surgery, or L5-S1, one-level surgery, it's a one to two-hour surgery with a one to two-day hospital stay. The disadvantage of this surgery is that there's left graft size, which means that cage that we talked about has less surface area to achieve a fusion between the top bone and the bottom bone. The second kind of lumbar fusion modern surgery is an A-lift, which is a surgery done from the front of the spine. Uh, I'm sorry, from the front of the abdomen with con in conjunction with an, a with, with an access surgeon, which is who is a vascular surgeon who knows how to approach the spine from the front by avoiding injury to the bowels or other vascular structures like the iliac arteries on the way to the spine. This is an extremely powerful technique for two levels of the spine, usually L4-5 and L5-S1, and it gives a powerful surgery reduction of spondylolisthesis, those slips that we talked about in the spine. And we and you can achieve really, really good indirect foraminal decompression, which means the um, these holes on the side of the spine can become significantly wider with a powerful maneuver such as this. And that's basically the, the gist of this surgery. Um, usually this can be done only from the front or partly on from the front and partly from the back because of the kind of dynamics of each each patient's spine, okay? Um, the front part of the procedure involves an incision below the belly button, just, to, just like this. And the back part of the surgery involves two little, sur two little incisions, just like the transforaminal uh, surgery that we talked about, okay? So once again, this can be used standalone, which means just from the front, or supplemented or held from the back by posterior screws through these little incisions over here. D-lift or X-lift, is a surgery done from the side. This is usually a direct lateral, which means directly from the side approach to the upper lumbar levels, L2-3, L3-4. Um, A-lift, which means the front, cannot access the upper lumbar levels due to great vessel anatomy, which means injury to bigger vessels that go down into the legs is more possible if you go from the front in these upper levels. And for that reason, we um, typically like to do this type of surgery from the side of the spine at these upper lumbar levels, okay? Um, once again, can be used standalone or with posterior screws. So standalone meaning by itself, through an incision in the side or an incision in the side and two little incisions to put screws in to hold everything in place. So once again, the incision is roughly kind of an oblique type incision. It's roughly four to five centimeters long. And then um, whether or not the surgeon chooses to do the back part of the surgery and puts two Little incisions on each side of the spine to hold it from the back is up to the surgeon and a negotiation and a discussion with the patient. For one level surgery, it's a two to three hour surgery and, for, and it's a two to three day hospital stay. Once again, large graft size and good fusion potential uh, is, a, is an advantage of this particular type of approach. And so the goal here is to create smaller incisions and to do everything um, through multiple incisions to get the better um, fusion kind of uh, um, uh, uh, goal. The goal is to create less exposure, less dissection, less disruption of normal patient's anatomy, less time in the hospital to get people up and walking faster with physical therapy, um, less need for pain medications, and lower chance of needing future surgery because of less disruption to 
above and below structures, resulting in reduced possibility of um, that adjacent segment disease. Um, so what are the choices about doing surgery without doing a fusion if for purely back pain? Well, there are a couple of proceed a, a couple of devices that have been FDA approved. One is called an artificial disc. An artificial disc is an FDA approved lumbar single level, either for L45 and L5S1. And for one or two level anterior cervical discectomies and fusion, I'm sorry, discectomies and, and, and disc replacements. Um, the symptoms are mainly from degenerative back pain with minimal leg pain. Um, the spine is able to maintain more motion than it would be with a fusion. However, the people that would benefit from surgeries of this kind are not a lot of them because, you know, this type of surgery is designed to increase or preserve motion. Sometimes the problem, it can be that the motion preservation itself creates the pain or prolongs the pain. So there's very few people that I think can benefit, you know, to, uh, to, the, to the extent um, that we want them to as physicians from these kinds of procedures. And so this is, uh, this is a lumbar fusion, uh, I'm sorry, a lumbar artificial disc. And this is a cervical, which means the neck artificial disc. Another um, uh, procedure or another device that we have um, available in our arsenal is called the CoFlex device. It sits in between the back of the spine and provides a little bit of uh, stability and a little bit of flexibility. So it's a kind of a halfway between a fusion and a motion preservation device. Um, another kind of procedure is a sacroiliac surgery. Um, sacroiliac surgery is because of inflammation of the sacroiliac joint, as we discussed in the previous uh, in, the, in, in the presentation. Um, the, well, the sacroiliac joint can become irritated because of a variety of reasons. Um, you know, uh, uh, multiple pregnancies can do it, previous trauma to the, to the spine, previous fusion surgery, where the sacroiliac joint then becomes the next degenerating segment. Um, uh, so uh, the way it's done is that a pain physician or a pain management physician injects the sacroiliac joints twice or three times with steroids. And if the patient has a really good reaction to that and the preoperative or the pre-injection pain is significantly better, then he, would, he or she would benefit from a sacroiliac fusion. Um, it's usually outpatient, one hour surgery uh, for each side and a one hour recovery, okay? Spine deformity surgery is the third family of spine surgery, which is um, uh, designed to correct large and abnormal curves in the spine where there's a mismatch of specific deformity parameters or, or measurements. Um, the pain is severe and because of loss of compensatory mechanisms of the muscles to help keep the head over the pelvis and keep the, can keep you from looking straight horizontally. Um, the goals of surgery is to balance the patient's head over the pelvis in the sagittal plane, which is um, the front to back plane. Um, it also gives the patient an appropriate lumbar lower doses to normalize the curves. As you can see, this patient preoperatively had a very flat lumbar curve and postoperatively after some powerful reduction mechanisms, um, this surgeon was able to achieve a nice lumbar curve, balance this patient's head over the pelvis, and that was the goal of the surgery. Um, future kind of uh, frontiers uh, uh, have kind of started to become incorporated into spine surgery. One is navigation, and navigation means basically building a 3D uh, picture within surgery of a patient's back and then um, developing a plan to get there um, by, by doing certain maneuvers. Robotic spine surgery is the next step from uh, navigation spine surgery. A robotic surgery, uh, um, a robot is available as a surgeon's assistant. Although they are not currently autonomous, they assist in performing complex large surgeries through smaller incisions and better planning. Uh, they assist in their ability to negotiate not normal anatomy. Uh, and of course, they have navigation, stereotactic navigation guidance to, uh, to help. And this, these are animations from the University of Miami where this patient's uh, this, uh, this surgeon has developed a plan for this patient over here. Um, and this is the one of the robots. And this is one of the robots from a system called Globus. Uh, and there are several spine systems now developing and testing robots in the spine, which are basically surgeon's assistants. 
All right. Um, let's talk about the fourth family of surgery, which are called spinal cord stimulators. This is an implantable device that goes into the epidural space and creates electrical impulses, which change the way the spinal cord transmits pain signals from the legs and from the trunk to the brain. Um, basically, it looks like a pacemaker, uh, except it's not a pacemaker for your heart. It's a pacemaker for your spine. Um, it is completely internal. However, to test whether this will help, um, we have pain management physicians to do a trial. And this is what a trial looks like, where temporarily um, the pain management physician places a small electrode on top of the spinal cord and um, sees whether or not it helps patients to a certain degree. So how do they work? They use electrical sim and they, they use electrical impulses to change the way the spinal cord transmits pain. Um, and there's a custom this this involves a customizable pattern of stimulation. Usually this is for chronic, um, which means prolonged neuropathic painful conditions, uh, patients with back pain who either do not require surgery or who have persistent pain after a surgery or who cannot undergo spine surgery. Okay. Um, Two kinds of leads are available in spinal cord stimulation surgery. One is called a percutaneous lead over here. Another one is called a paddle lead, which is over here. Um, the, pain, uh, pain, the pain management doc, then after the surgeon has implanted the lead, can then change the way the lead transmits electricity into the spinal cord. And it can make, he or she can make fine tuning adjustments for the, to customize this plan to, to, for the patient. This is a permanent implantation, two incisions. Uh, one's about one inch and the other one's about an inch and a half or so. It should be a little bit bigger than this for the battery. Um, one is for the lead itself and one is for the battery over here. Um, it's a one to one and a half hour surgery with one to one hour recovery. Typically, this is an outpatient surgery. Patients go home after the surgery. And once again, uh, what matters most is the patient experience. We want to uh, start with what patients want in their end goal to be. Um, we then want to, want to work backwards from what the goal is so that we don't lose sight of what patients' goals are. You know, not everybody wants to be an Olympic lifter. Um, some patients just want to chase their grandkids around their, the living room. Some patients want to do silver sneakers. Some patients want to be athletes. And so we want to tailor what we do as surgeons to what the patient's goals are. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Shigeri. We have several questions. The first one is, as we get older, we always have some type of back pain from time to time, sometimes pretty bad pain, but then it goes away. When is the right time to see yeah. a spine doctor? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, a spine doctor is, is several kinds of doctor. There's a spine pain management physician, there's a physiatrist, and then there's the spine surgeon. You know, um, typically what I would start with is the primary care physician. The primary care doctor is like the quarterback of this entire team. Um, he or she can direct your care to start with a pain management doctor or um, then go into a physical therapist with a phys physiatrist. And if the pain is unable to be controlled by these means, then I think it's, it's reasonable to see a spine surgeon as well. That doesn't mean you're going to have surgery right away. It means that the spine surgeon can make sure that the pain management doctor and the physical therapist doctor are doing the things in the right order. Okay. Great. When seeing a spine doctor, is the x-ray the first step? And is the x-ray usually enough to tell how bad or not bad your back may be? Um, great question again. Um, I'm going to keep saying great question <laughs> because the, most of these are great questions. Um, so the x-ray is a first step. The reason why the x-ray is a first step is because we want to make sure the alignment of the spine is correct. We want to make sure when the patient flexes and extends, there's no abnormal motion that gives us clues as to whether or not more imaging is necessary or physical therapy is the next step. Um, uh, I think more often than not, we always kind of get an MRI scan to make sure that there are not insidious or hidden reasons for pain, such as cancer such as infection and those kinds of things that can need surgery first or ahead of time. Great. What kind of surgery would be done for a PARS defect? Yeah, that's a great question again. So <laughs> a PARS defect is either an acquired or an, an abnormal occurring break 
in the bone that allows for abnormal motion in one way or the other. Sometimes it leads to purely back pain. Sometimes it leads to slippage of the spine, the top bone slipping on top of the bottom bone and then going back and going forward and going back. So typically what we start off first with is an MRI scan to make sure that there's no large herniated disc. Sometimes uh, what we can do if there is a large herniated disc as a result of a parse defect is do a small discectomy. However, unfortunately, sometimes these can set patients up for needing bigger surgeries down the line. There are a minority of surgeons that recommend doing a spinal fusion surgery straight away in people that have these PARS defects resulting in the movement. However, the PARS defect by itself does not mean you need surgery, but if it results in excessive and abnormal movement or a herniated disc, then I think surgery may be the thing you wanna consider. What if the first steroid injection doesn't work? Will another shot help? Yeah, um, it depends upon what kind of steroid injection we're talking about. We, we kind of discussed that there are several kinds of steroid injections. One's an epidural steroid injection. One's a transforaminal steroid injection. And uh, uh, there are translaminar steroid injections. There are caudal epidural steroid injections. So I think that it depends upon which kind of injection we're talking about. Oh, and there are something called PARS injections where PARS defects can be injected to reduce back pain. Um, additionally, there are facet injections where they, people inject uh, steroids into the joints of the spine. However, um, I think that just one injection may have too few data points to make a determination as to whether or not this is the right therapy. So I think definitely a second injection. And if that one works, a third injection might be something that you want to consider. But of course, you know, this needs to be in, in concert with a surgeon and with a pain management doctor who kind of can tell you whether or not the next step is additional injections or a consideration for surgery. How often do patients with herniated discs and radicular pain have to have surgery? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say that a minority of patients with herniated discs need surgery. Um, some of the times, um, you know, these herniated discs or these fresh fragments are gelatin. And this gelatin can dry up over time and reduce pressure off the nerves. Um, and so conservative care, like um, an inversion table, physical therapy, injections can buy patients more time for this gelatin to dry up and the pressure be taken off the nerves. And, you know, in, in my practice, several patients have not, you know, had to undergo surgery because in about, you know, six to eight weeks, the pain was better. Um, as you saw from the presentation, um, the gross majority of patients that have back pain or leg pain can get better without surgery. How often does a disc at the same level herniate again after surgery? Yeah, great question. <laughs> so um, in my experience and with some of the literature that uh, we have, we have um, kind of uh, reviewed as spine surgeons, between 10 and 20% of herniated discs can re-herniate within the same level in the first two weeks, primarily because of patient non-compliance with restrictions, which means um, if patients do not respond or, 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 or go by the restrictions the surgeon has given them, it is more at risk they are more at risk for that disc herniating within the first two weeks. Um, it is a, a fair minority of patients that have a re-herniation of the disc within like a year or something like that. And that's because a, a layer of scar tissue forms over the, uh, the break in the disc where the jelly popped out of the donut. Um, and it, it, while it doesn't make it like brand new, it is um, uh, to the point where it's not as dangerous for a disc to herniate. Um, after the first break. Okay. Is minimally invasive surgery better than traditional? Uh, it depends on what kind of minimally invasive we're talking about. Um, so, and, and once again, also depends upon what better means to, uh, to the, the patients asking that question. So um, minimally invasive surgery has been shown to have a quicker recovery, um, quicker uh, time to physical therapy, and overall um, lesser pain than traditional surgery. However, the outcomes, which means the 12-month, 18-month outcomes for both 
minimally invasive and open surgery are have seen to be or have um, have have uh, resulted to be the same with time. So there's that acute period where a minimally invasive surgery is better, but over time the two kind of even out to the effectiveness. Now, if we're talking about discectomies, that's a little bit different. If we're talking about lumbar fusions, that's a little bit different too. But um, in our long-term studies, there has not seemed to be a major difference between minimally invasive and fusion surgeries uh, and, uh, um, and, and traditional open surgeries. How many levels can be fused in your spine? Um, it depends upon uh, what we're trying to treat here. So um, for um, spondylolisthesis or a one-level slip, I think a one-level surgery is pretty reasonable. Um, for um, uh, severe arthritis from at, at multiple levels of the spine, multiple levels of the spine can be uh, can can help to be immobilized or stopped with painful motion. Um, for spine deformity surgery, where there's a large curve in the spine, we may need to um, disconnect some parts of the spine and then realign them back into their normal spinal alignment or as close to normal as we can have. And so multiple fusions can occur. Um, for deformity surgery of the kind we just mentioned, a T10 to pelvis or a T6 to pelvis, which is, you know, 12 to 13 levels, sometimes, you know, 15 levels can can be done um, for smaller degenerative spine conditions. Two to four segments are pretty reasonable to do. And in very focused things, just one level is sufficient to, to, um, to achieve the patient's goal. How long is recovery for lumbar fusion and which kind of lumbar fusion is best? Um, once again, unfortunately, that answer can change based on what we're talking about uh, for a um, uh, one to two level lumbar fusion. Um, I would say if it's done from the back, the, uh, it's similar to the outcome done from the side or from the front. Um, the, uh, the, the recovery period is between two and four weeks. So for two weeks, uh, we have uh, significant restrictions, you know, no excessive bending, twisting, and turning, no lifting more than 15 pounds, no walking more than, you know, 10 minutes at a time, three times a day. Uh, at two weeks, the, the restrictions are liberalized. So, um, you know, patients can drive and those kinds of things. Um, uh, we do have, we do advocate the use of a back brace for six full weeks while the spine is, is, uh, is healing. Um, so those are, those are restrictions for lumbar fusion surgery, which type of surgery is best. That unfortunately also depends. <laughs> um, it depends upon the patient. So at one level of the spine, sometimes I advocate going from the front and from the back. Um, so that is for a very specific kind of patient, um, one that has one or two level surgery. Um, uh, uh, yeah, some patients cannot have that surgery. And so a surgeon off in the back is, you know, completely reasonable. Those can be done from two to four levels with a similar recovery period. Um, the fusion, once again, is, is relatively similar in terms of outcomes two, or sorry, one to two years down the line. So, yeah. All right, that was our last question. Any additional questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Shakiri. Thank you very much. Real privilege to talk to you guys. Thank you for participating in tonight's webinar. Our next webinar will be held on Tuesday, June 6th. Dr. Scott Stevens will be speaking on shoulder. Enjoy the rest of your evening and good night. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much.